an emergency button in case I, in case uh, the lecture is going really badly, I can just <laughs> press that and. <laughs> no, this, this, the camera follows you. Ah, okay. And uh, yeah, let me just check this out. This is pointer and this is advancing. Uh, okay, so, uh, and the microphone seems to be working, so is that everybody uh, can hear me as well, I guess, so I can go ahead and start. So I guess uh, a big part of the talk will be to explain to you what I mean by the title. Uh, so this work was, uh, has been posted on the archive and published, and here are the references for any more details that, uh, uh, you know, that I might have to skim over a little bit in the, in the talk. Okay, so the issue uh, in the background, well, in the foreground as well, of what I'm going to be addressing is the black hole information loss issue. And I just want to briefly remind people of the situation. So I've drawn a standard space-time diagram here of an object that is collapsing to form a black hole, and then this black hole is slowly evaporating, uh, and eventually in this picture the black hole evaporates completely, leaving, uh, you know, behind, I mean, all of the energy goes off in Hawking radiation uh, here during the evaporation phase radiating, radiating off to infinity. And now the issue is if we start with some pure quantum state down here, then after we've formed the black hole, we'll evolve to some pure quantum state up here, but there'll be entanglement between the degrees of freedom outside the black hole and what's inside the black hole, and indeed the Hawking radiation in the quantum fields and curved space-time calculation uh, is entangled with, well, excitations, quote, particles or whatever inside the black hole. So that isn't something that disturbs people typically much, but if the black hole, assuming the black hole evaporates completely, one is left then with the state of the field here that's still entangled with excitations that had been inside the black hole, and unless these come out in some manner, either in the last moments of the evaporation or before the evaporation, one will be left with a mixed state. And it's very hard to see how to get these out. So, you know, I think the straightforward picture would be that you end up with evolving from a pure state uh, to a mixed state in, in this uh, process. So, I guess this is repeating what I've said, that the final state should be mixed. The overwhelming majority of physicists who, you know, talk about this or write on this are very unhappy with this. Of course, the overwhelming majority of physicists are string theorists or particle physicists, not general relativists or whatever. I've never, I mean, I've been involved in this for 40 years. I don't understand why people are so unhappy with ending up with a mixed state that People are, are willing to uh, endorse really radical ideas like firewalls, or that, which is basically the idea that the correlations don't exist across this horizon or they, they get destroyed in some way, which will automatically make the horizon singular. The fuzzball idea is even more radical that you don't even form a black hole uh, in the first place. Okay, but uh, a less radical type of idea would be that the information is stored in the black hole, but it comes out in some sort of final burst uh, at late times. I mean, at very late times when the black hole is down to Planck mass and we don't know how to describe it. Uh, I mean, we'd need a full quantum theory of gravity to describe it. So usually, the, I mean, this idea of it coming out in a final burst has been around for the 40 years that people have been discussing these sort of things. It's usually dismissed be, just on the grounds that uh, you would have to have some burst of particles to carry this information off. 
and those particles would have to be Planck energy, and you'd need as many of them as Hawking particles, and you just, but you've only got a Planck energy's worth left, so you just don't have nearly enough energy to carry away the information. At least that's the argument that's usually made. But there is a really nice uh, paper of Hota, Schutzold, and Unrove from, I guess by now it must be four or five years ago, that strongly suggests that this is not necessarily the case. They look at a one plus one dimensional mirror model of Hawking radiation. I'll explain that. Mo the talk will be mostly analyzing this uh, model in some detail. But what they concluded is that, uh, that in this model where there is automatically no information loss, there's no black hole, there's no singularity, but there is an analog of Hawking radiation. In this model, they argued that the Hawking radiation is actually entangled with vacuum fluctuations at late time. So the information comes out in the form of vacuum fluctuations. That sounds like it doesn't cost any energy uh, and maybe do doesn't cost any particle emission or anything like that. That's what I want to estimate, so I, or look at, analyze maybe is a better word than estimate. Uh, I want to, so what I'm going to do in this talk is explain this mirror model, explain how the information does come out in this model, and try to understand if that might, if there might be a similar way that information might come out in the black hole case without a large energy cost. Okay, so I have to begin by uh, talking about the, no, saying a few words about the notion of particles. I mean, if we, in Minkowski space time or more generally in a stationary space time, it's conventional to define a notion of particles using positive frequency modes. In a general space time that isn't stationary, um, or as we'll see in space times that are stationary but have different killing fields, uh, you know, but anyway, it, it, well, in particular, in a non-stationary space time, one can't use that notion. But if you look mathematically what is of what is needed to define in a consistent way a notion of particles, uh, what you need to do is define uh, some subspace of solutions, which would correspond to the positive frequency solutions in the usual definition where you have a time translation symmetry. And what this subspace uh, has to satisfy is that the Klein-Gordon product, I should say, I, I probably have said somewhere that I'm going to restrict to a Klein-Gordon scalar field and momentarily I'm going to restrict to a massless Klein-Gordon scalar field. The Klein-Gordon product has to be positive definite on the solutions you're causing, calling positive frequency. It has to be orthogonal in this product to the complex conjugate solutions, which I'll call the, quote, negative frequency solutions, even though we're not taking Fourier transforms here. This is just the word for the subspace. And the positive and negative frequency solutions have to be suitably complete. The suitably complete is really if I have any solution with initial data, smooth solution with initial data of compact support, I want to be able to write that as a sum of positive and negative frequency solutions. So the fact that we can make definitions of particles mathematically consistent with these rules will be important in what I'm going to say. Um, and an important application of what I've just said, uh, well, is to one plus one dimensional Minkowski space time. I'm going to be putting a mirror in this space time in a minute and telling you the Hoda Schutzhold Unruh model and uh, analyzing the results of that. But let's consider just the full Minkowski space-time. Uh, 
I'm going to choose an origin, and I'm going to break up the Minkowski space-time into four wedges that I've labeled this way. The Lorentz boost, so the, what I'm about, the first part of what I'm about to say is very well known. The second part of what I'm about to say is remarkably unknown. It's not totally unknown. It is in the literature before, but it, it's, it's surprising how rarely uh, this is alluded to, but this will pay a, play a big role in the talk. So here in this right wedge that I've labeled one Rindler, the Lorentz boost killing field is timelike. I can view this wedge as a space-time in its own right, and I can use a standard definition of positive frequency in this wedge to define a notion of particles in this wedge, and I can similarly define a notion of particles uh, in this wedge, and that is referred to as Rindler quantization. Uh, uh, at least that's one name for it, and what I'll show you in a moment is what the Minkowski vacuum state looks like in terms of Rindler particles. What's less, much less well known, uh, but not unknown uh, before this work, is that in these wedges, which I've labeled three miln and four miln, uh, there is, there, there's no killing field that's time-like, but there is a conformal killing field. The dilations, the scale transformations, those are time-like in these wedges. In, in higher dimensions, these would be light cones uh, where that would be time-like. And if I consider a massless uh, field, those, the, these, or any field that's scale invariant, this will define a symmetry of the field. So I can look at positive frequency solutions with respect to the dilation killing field up here, and, well, minus the dilation killing field down here will give me a future-directed time-like symmetry, and I can define a notion of particles here and here. I've called, I've used the word Milne because the future light cone or the past light cone, is a Milne universe. It's an FLRW model with hyperbola slicings. And the dilation killing field then is, is you know, a, a preferred FLRW, uh, you know, cosmological observer. Uh, you know, this would be the, you know, conformal time coordinate, you know, the coordinate vector field of the conformal time coordinate uh, if you viewed it as an FLRW model. Now, a very interesting fact, and this is only now for one plus one dimensions, because in higher dimensions, the Milne things would be cones, but the Rindler wedges would be defined by hyperplanes, so they don't match up. But in one plus one dimensions, they do match up. Uh, and if you take a Rindler particle mode here that's left moving, when it propagates here, it's going to be a Milne particle mode. And you can see that most easily because the boost killing field and this dilation killing field coincide on the horizon. So they define equivalent or identical notions of positive frequency. Um, both of these uh, have arbitrary normalizations. I'm going to normalize them for convenience so that they have some, I mean, this is some arbitrary number, that, but I want the surface gravity to be some chosen number kappa on the horizon. OK, so this, uh, oh, no, I need one more. I do need a little bit more background before we do the model. But I will get to the model momentarily. So there's one calculational fact that uh, will underlie every calculation in what I'm going to say, and it also underlies the Hawking effect and the Unruh effect. So if I consider uh, some wave packet in this region, it could be left moving or right moving, doesn't matter, uh, 
that is positive frequency with frequency peaked near omega uh, with respect to the Rindler notion of positive frequency, so Lorentz boost time. So let me call such a wave packet F1 omega. Uh, so I, I'm going to take it to be sharply peaked about omega. I, I don't want to consider wave packets that go out to infinity. You know, I really want it to be a wave packet as well. Then if I uh, reflect this solution about the origin, I'm going to get some solution here. Uh, that solution will actually be negative frequency. So I'm going to write it as the complex conjugate of some positive frequency solution F2 omega. OK, then it is a fact if you take Fourier transforms that if I take this F1 omega and this factor times the F2 omega bar, its reflection, though the wave packet here and that reflection there, this thing is purely positive frequency with respect to inertial time, the Minkowski notion. And similarly, if I do it in the opposite way, uh, I also get something that's purely positive frequency with respect to inertial time. So this gives, this for, these formulas give rise to a Bogolubov transformation between the quantization constructions where I use inertial positive frequency rather than inertial, than uh, boost positive frequency in Rindler wedges one and two. Uh, and that gives rise to a formula for what the Minkowski vacuum looks like as in terms of Rindler particle states. Let me get rid of the hand from the formula. So you can see it. So th what the Minkowski vacuum is, is an entangled state of Rindler particles in wedge one and wedge two uh, in the corresponding reflection modes with this exponential factor coming in and the sum taking place and then the product over all such modes, uh, that's what the Minkowski vacuum is. Now, I guess I didn't write it down here, but if we look, if we ask what is the state uh, in just wedge one, where I trace out, form a density matrix by tracing out over wedge two, then, well, this will get a square of this factor, which will just be a Boltzmann factor. I mean, we'll get exactly a thermal distribution of particles, Rindler particles in wedge one uh, at a temperature kappa over two pi uh, coming in. Uh, and of course, we'll similarly get a thermal distribution of Rindler particles in wedge two. In exactly the same way, if I do this with the Milne quantization, uh, I'll get an entangled state of Milne particles in the future cone with Milne particles in the past cone. Uh, and, well, the formulas are identical because the modes are actually identical, as I've already explained. And the Minkowski vacuum is a thermal state of Milne particles in the future cone, as well as a thermal state of Milne particles in the past cone at a temperature kappa over 2 pi uh, as well. And it's useful to keep in mind, I didn't write the formulas down here, but one can do a kind of mixed thing. If you look at, uh, you could look at left moving uh, well, let's look at right moving modes since I have the labels here. Uh, I can consider the, the right moving, well, modes as Milne particles if they're at later times and Rindler particles at earlier times. And the right moving modes will be an entangled state of Milne and Rindler particles uh, moving to the right, entangled across this 
horizon that, again, of course, will give you a thermal state of Rindler or a thermal state of Milne. Uh, that will be useful to keep in mind uh, in the later things that I'm going to tell you. And the later things that I'm going to tell you are now this moving mirror model, which I'll show you the picture of and then give words for. Now, this picture is very busy with a lot of wave packets that will eventually come in to the story. But for right now, uh, what I want you to focus on is this is two-dimensional Minkowski space-time, just like I was drawing here, except that I have a mirror trajectory drawn in, and I've also explicitly put in scry minus and scry plus uh, here, because that'll be convenient later. And what the mirror trajectory is supposed to do, so I'm only going to be concerned with the space-time to the right of this mirror. The mirror will impose Dirichlet boundary conditions on the scalar field. So I'm going to start with an inertial mirror at rest in whatever you know, rest coordinates I'm drawing this picture in. Then I'm going to have the mirror accelerate to the left in a particular manner. I'll, for a long period of time, I'll show you the formula for that in a, in a minute. And then I'm going to have the mirror become inertial again. The mirror will not have to return to rest relative to its initial state. It could continue moving off to the left. But if I showed it moving off to the left, it's very hard to see. I mean, it could stop as well. I want to consider the general case. Uh, but it does have to become inertial. And well, I'll explain to you in a minute when it has to become inertial by. But let me repeat what I've just said with the words here and with one uh, formula. So the, the we're starting with a, a static mirror. And one thing I didn't say but I'm saying now is I'm going to take the quantum field to be in its initial ground state. So it'll be a vacuum state, ordinary vacuum, inertial vacuum state on all of scry minus uh, here with this inertial mirror. If I kept the inertial mirror, it would just be a very boring static. It would evolve just as a very boring static ground state. But I'm going to then have the mirror move, and I'm going to have it move on this uh, trajectory for some possibly very long period of time. That's up to me. Uh, and then I'm going to have it uh, move inertially again, as I've already shown you. Now, the additional thing I can put in here is that when it's moving in this manner, it's going to asymptote toward the null line v equals 0, uh, which I've shown here in this dotted line. So what I'm go I am going to demand that by the time this dotted line actually intersects the mirror trajectory, you can't see it here the way I've drawn it, but by the time this dotted line actually hits the mirror trajectory, the mirror has become inertial again. Uh, so I mean, that's just a restriction in this model of how quickly I have to make the mirror become inertial, but it's not a problem, you know, there's no difficulty in principle uh, doing that. And again, I've shown the mirror returning to rest, but it, it, it only has to be inertial. It could be moving rapidly to the left when I'm, when I'm done. OK, so, to, uh, so we want to understand uh, particle creation in this case. And you'll see in this uh, second remark what uh, this has to do with the Hawking effect. But there, so there are two critical observations that, and that's pretty much all that's needed to understand what's going on in this uh, in this model or the key aspects of it. Maybe I'll start with the second one. So, uh, well, 
this is what you'll need to do in order to calculate particle creation in this model. But if I start with an ordinary inertial positive frequency solution up here uh, at scry plus, uh, which I've labeled H for a Hawking mode, because this will end up being a Hawking particle mode when the calculation is completed. If I propagate this back into the past, this wave packet, it will bounce off the mirror. The mirror trajectory here is chosen so that when it bounces off the mirror, it'll get, going backward in time, it'll get very highly blue shifted bouncing off this mirror that's moving at near the speed of light because it's following this trajectory and it started more than kappa ago in accelerating like that. So it, you know, it's moving fast to the left following this uh, trajectory, which will highly blue shift. Um, and well, the point is this trajectory is chosen so that the evolution backward is exactly what you would get in the case that Hawking analyzed of gravitational collapse to a black hole, where the blue shift would now be the gravitational blue shift that the backward in time propagating wave packet would, would uh, undergo. But the, the point of this particular motion is that that gives you exactly the same blue shift as you get in the gravitational collapse case, and you will end up with the exact same prediction of Hawking radiation in this moving mirror case, identically to the original you know, Hawking cal type calculation for a black hole. Now, there's a better way of saying what this, or a nice way of saying what this wave packet becomes when you reflect it off the mirror, blue shift it, and propagate it back to scry minus, which is that it becomes a wave packet, which I'm denoting at scry minus, H tilde, of Milne positive frequency omega. The blue shifting is basically converting the inertial, I guess I'm continue jumping around, the inertial frequency omega here to a Milne frequency uh, down here. OK. Uh, and in particular, by the mathematics of the calculation I was showing you, if I add this factor uh, times, uh, uh, times its reflection about v equals 0, so if I reflect this about v equals 0, the asymptote of the null line, to get this red squiggly thing, then when I add a linear combination of these two things, I get something that's purely positive frequency with respect to inertial time. OK, so that's one important fact about the, the mirror trajectory. The other, even maybe more important fact, is that, that is easily seen, and sorry for all this jumping around, but if we look at the state of the quantum field up here, uh, after the mirror has become inertial again, so above this dotted line, because the mirror has become inertial by that retarded time, the state of the quantum field up here is exactly the ordinary vacuum state for this inertial motion of the trajectory. So you can see that because if you look at the quantum field or its you know, correlation function, some arbitrary correlation function up here, if you propagate that back in the past, it's only going to care about what is going on on the past because it's a massless field now. It's only going to care about what's going on on its past light cone. The, Light, the, the null geodesics or the null geodesic going this way is just coming directly from scry where I've imposed the inertial vacuum state. But the, the one going this way is going to bounce off the mirror while it's in an inertial state and also go to scry. And I'm just therefore going to end up 
I mean, there's no way that an observer, that the fields here would know that this mirror was not inertial forever. Uh, so I'm just going to end up with the inertial vacuum state uh, for this inertial mirror trajectory uh, up in this region up here. Okay, so a lot of machinery in here. Uh, uh, we're now set to do a particle creation calculation, and here's where I'm going to take advantage of my freedom in defining particles. So, again, sorry for be jumping around, but I want to define a notion of particles for the modes that reach scry plus. Well, there's an obvious way of defining particles here, which I am going to switch to later on, which is solutions that are positive frequency with respect to ordinary inertial time translations up here. But it will be convenient, very convenient for representing the state to choose the following very unorthodox notion of particles uh, up here, and that's what I'm going to do, so why don't I leave it? I'll go back to the words uh, in a minute, I'll, but I'll show you it here. So at early times, uh, so I'm going to pick a basis of positive frequency solutions, which will consist at early times here of ordinary of wave packets of ordinary inertial positive frequency solutions. At the later times above this dotted line, I'm going to define the notion of positive frequency here with respect to Milne time. So I'm going to use Milne part, I'm going to use inertial particles here as my notion of particles. I'm going to use Milne particles here. And at Late times here near the dotted line, I'm going to use the Rindler notion of particles. Now, there has to be kind of separation between the Hawking modes and the relevant, uh, you know, well, what will end up being the relevant Milne and Rindler modes. There has to be a reasonable time separation between them to do this consistently, uh, but I'm going to assume, you know, that will depend on the inertial, the trajectory of the mirror, but if I bring the mirror nearly to rest, that will easily be satisfied, and I can do that. If I don't bring the mirror to rest and have it moving rapidly to the left, then this picture will be somewhat inconsistent, but I'll only use it as a heuristic picture in that case anyway. But this will be a very useful way of thinking about it. So, uh, here is probably worth saying this, le letting you read this again in uh, words. I'm going to, well, define in positive frequency just with the usual inertial notion, but I'm going to use for out states inertial time positive frequency for things emerging in early times and Milne and Rindler notions for things that are emerge at times near the retarded time at which the mirror becomes inertial again. OK, so we can do this calculation. And uh, I think I'm best off going back to this picture. So uh, you get particle creation just in general in the formalism if starting with an inertial po purely positive frequency solution down here when you propagate it forward in time and look at it up here it picks up positive and negative it picks up a non-trivial negative frequency part so uh, what I'm going to do is start with this uh, packet here that I got from propagating the Hawking packet backward in time, and add to that this reflected Rindler part. So this is a Milne particle mode, 
And I'm going to add to that the reflected Rindler particle mode with this exponential factor to produce a purely positive frequency solution here. I mean, this is exactly the same calculation that goes into the calculation of the Hawking effect, I should say. So we're going to start, I'm going to start with this mode. Now, what happens when I propagate this into the future? Well, this blue thing bounces off the mirror, gets redshifted, and becomes this Hawking mode, which comes out at early times and is purely positive frequency in inertial time. So that's purely positive frequency. This Rindler mode, well, really negative frequency, Rindler mode is, you know, the thing that's sort of entangled initially with this Milne mode. It propagates freely along until it hits the mirror after it's become inertial. When it, it doesn't change its frequencies, or it just scales its frequencies, uh, uh, after it bounces off the mirror, and a, a purely positive frequency Rindler mode is going to become a purely positive frequency Milne mode. But this is actually a purely negative frequency uh, Rindler mode, so this is going to be a purely negative frequency Milne mode here. So we've broken up this positive frequency solution into its positive and negative frequency parts. And if we carry through on the particle creation calculation, what we find is that the Hawking particles are perfectly entangled in this way that looks like the formulas I was writing down before with Milne particles uh, in the corresponding mode. So that's what happens in this one mode that gets tensored in with all the other modes that are orthogonal to that. Let me focus on this one mode. OK, so this is really nice. And this is what Hoda, Schutzhold, and Unruh were talking about when they said that there were partner particles which were really vacuum fluctuations. Now I can say that very precisely. These partner particles of the Hawking particles are Milne modes. They are Milne particles, but Milne particles are or can be vacuum fluctuations. So let's, to illustrate or explain what I'm talking about here, Let's look at what the state of the system is with respect to the Hawking particle mode. Well, we take the density matrix as usual from this by you know, multiplying this with its uh, conjugate and tracing out over the Milne modes. When we do that, we're going to get an exactly thermal distribution of Hawking particles, just as Hawking would have told you for the black hole case. What happens uh, if we uh, uh, ask, well, what is the Milne particle state? Well, we do exactly the same thing, trace things out in the same way. We get a thermal distribution of Milne particles. But a thermal distribution of Milne particles is exactly the Minkowski vacuum. That was what I showed you in the earlier formulas. The Minkowski vacuum is a thermal distribution of Milne particles. So in this very, but this is a pure state. So in this very precise sense, uh, the Hawking particles are entangled with vacuum fluctuations in the final vacuum state. Uh, and all of the information, in the same sense as being used in the black hole information issue, all of the information about the Hawking particles is comes out after the mirror has become inertial again, and it comes out in the form of vacuum fluctuations that are entangled with the Hawking particles. OK, so that's great. And that was, uh, you know, so does that mean that we, you know, can get out the information? I mean, vacuum fluctuations don't cost any energy. So is this energy free, and can we do the, 
do we have to be creating inertial particles in doing this? And what's the whole situation? Well, that's what I want to tell you about in the remainder of the talk. Now, I mean, there isn't that much time in the remainder of the talk, but the main point was to explain this model. The rest of this will be relatively easy. There's one more calculation that will have to be done with that. So you might think as the way I'm suggesting it, and, and as I've just said, that there's no, uh, this is a kind of cost-free way of getting the information out. But there is, you can see that there is a problem with this because I've taken this Milne mode and entangled it in the final state with a Hawking mode. But in the global Minkowski vacuum, this Milne mode is supposed to be reflect is supposed to be entangled with a corresponding Rindler mode. And this Rindler mode is now left hanging. It either isn't going to be entangled, which would be a bad state, or it would have to be entangled with something else, and you're going to go down the line. I, I mean, you're going to have a problem across the horizon if you're not entangling uh, these modes in any case. So we can see, so that gives you a word indication that there should be a problem. We can get an actual calculation that shows that there is some sort of problem. If I now construct the positive frequency mode based, the inertial positive frequency mode based on the, the Milne mode that, that ended up entangled with the Hawking mode and the mode that it was supposed to be entangled with that Rindler mode. So this is a positive frequency inertial mode at Scry plus. And I can ask how many part inertial particles are going to come out in this mode? Well, this positive frequency relationship implies a Bogolubov transformation with this relationship between the Minkowski annihilation operator and the Milne and Rindler annihilation and creation operators. Uh, and we can just calculate the expected number of particles in the inertial mode F1. And I've just written out the formula for the annihilation and creation operators, and we get this uh, messy looking thing. But the first term is easily recognizable. That's the expected number of, uh, well, we have this extra factor in front that's bigger than one. That's the only thing that's important about it's bigger than one. We, this thing is just telling us S or that this expectation value is just the expected number of Milne particles in mode F1, but there are exactly as many Milne particles as Hawking particles in that mode. So this term is at least as big, really bigger because of this factor, than the expected number of Hawking particles. Well, there are all these other terms, but this term is also a positive term, so that makes this, this inequality hold. Then we have these cross terms. And if the final state was the Minkowski vacuum, these cross terms would exactly cancel these, and we would get a, a zero for the expected number of particles in this inertial mode. But for a state, of this form, it's easy to see that the cross terms don't contribute at all because they affect one of these guys, uh, but not this guy. And that produces an, an orthogonal state to what we started with. So remarkably, these terms don't contribute. And what this says is there are that there have to be at least as many real inertial particles in this model in this particular mode as there are Hawking particles. So you're gonna, you are going to have a large burst of particles at the end, even though you've entangled with the vacuum. Now, what about energy cost? Well, 
these aren't energy eigenstates, but nevertheless, uh, as an estimate of how much energy comes out, it ought to be the number of particles times the energy per particle. So we have to now figure out, the key thing is to now figure out how much energy, uh, expected energy, would it be in this uh, uh, particular mode. And that very much depends on the state of the mirror. And I think maybe rather than going through all of these words, it'll be easier to go back to the picture. So I'm basically trying to figure out what frequencies come in to these guys. And these guys were so constructed by starting with a Hawking mode, highly blue shifting it, getting this Rindler mode here, and then propagating it back and reflecting it off the mirror. Well, this guy is extremely high frequency. This guy is extremely high frequency. When it bounces off the mirror, it's very important to see what the velocity of the mirror is. If the mirror is at rest again, like I've drawn it, then this is also going to be extremely high frequency. And the energy of this mode that I make up here is going to be extremely high energy. But if I make the mirror just become inertial uh, without, you know, I think I use the word let it glide instead of stopping it, uh, here in this, uh, we just sort of turn off the acceleration, but without, then you're going to get a huge redshift effect in bouncing off the mirror, and these modes will not come out high frequency. You can make them come out, they will come out with very low energy compared to the Hawking particles. So in the mirror model, if you don't stop the mirror, you can recover the information. You're still going to be emitting more particles uh, than you emitted Hawking particles in this recovery pot process, but they can be of arbitrarily low energy, and there's negligible energy cost in doing that. Okay, but once this is understood, then you can see that there's a big problem doing, trying to do this kind of thing in black hole evaporation. So in the black hole evaporation, we don't have a model of you know, what comes out and so on, but we could just imagine that maybe the Hawking particles are entangled with Milne modes in the final vacuum state in a similar way as in the mirror case. The problem is that there isn't any, going back to my mirror picture, there isn't any analog in the black hole case of letting the mirror glide and having the stuff come out you know, over an extremely extended time period. So I, I mean, there isn't any plausible analog, let me say, or uh, you know, uh, of this. I mean, in the black hole case, going back to my early diagram, I mean, you have a vacuum state in, you know, in the standard picture up here, which would be very much like a future light cone, and you can have Milne particles here, you, so you could easily, as I've already done, write down a state where the Hawking particles are entangled with the Milne particles here. But the Milne modes would have to emerge from near the vertex of this light cone. Otherwise, when you propagate them back, if they go off the side of the cone, they go out to infinity, and it's hard to see where that's coming, how that's coming from the black hole or whatever. Uh, so, though I can write this down, the same analysis says that there's going to be a particle cost to this. Uh, but now we're in a situation where these particles 
it's hard to see how they would not have Planck energy that they would have to be emerging from the near the, you know, from Planck scale near the evaporation event. So the bottom line is that this really neat, I mean, what I thought was incredibly neat and still think a neat scenario suggested by the Hota, Schutzold, and Unruh uh, model ends up being just the standard burst scenario where you need a number of particles at least as big as the number of Hawking particles that you emitted, and you need the energy per particle to be Planck scale. So I don't think this gives a plausible way of restoring information in the black hole case, but I certainly think the idea that information can be stored in vacuum fluctuations is a really interesting idea in its own right that's explicitly shown in these models. Okay, thank you. Hello, hello. Sorry. So there, there had been a suggestion for a long time that a way to get around this information problem would be to have a long-lived remnant, and the remnant is close to Planck size. Yeah. Uh, but it slowly leaks out. Yeah. Long wavelength particles. So that seems really very similar to what you're doing, what you get over here. You have long wavelength particles that are then entangled uh, with the Hawking radiation. Not much energy cost, but a lot of particles that are. That yeah. Are, that so are this would not say anything against the remnant type model. I don't think it would really add a lot to the remnant model either. And those models, I mean, again, I don't understand the popularity or unpopularity of the various ideas, but the remnant ideas have not generally been popular. I can give arguments or reasons, but I, you know. But anyway, I, but I, the, the, I'm agreeing with the, with, uh, I'm agreeing 100% with your comment that you know, that would still, that, what I'm saying does not negate that, and I don't think it really adds to that either. It, it had the potential of really saying something, you know, making the burst models plausible and energy cost free, but as I concluded, I just, I don't see how it can do that. Questions? I had a question. Yeah, do you? Yeah. Okay, so go suppose, ahead. Suppose we had a theory of gravity which had no singularities. Suppose we could complete the quantum theory. Yeah. Would information loss bother you in that case? Well, I mean, I, I think you wouldn't. Yeah, so let's go to this. So now we don't have a singularity here, so I'm going to have to say what this gets replaced by, and, you know, maybe the origin moves sort of back over here and everything comes out. That's what I was describing, and I don't really see how that could be made to work. But, I mean, if it could, you wouldn't have information. You know, more plausibly, this, you know, the information that propagated in here, if this is not a singularity, would propagate into some other universe. So then I would not be at all bothered by the, you know, by any reason of having a mixed state here, you're just entangled with this now disconnected, presumably, universe or something. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you got rid of all singularities, then you should always have a final pure state, but it might be an entangled state of your universe with some other universe, and there's really information loss in your universe, and that would not bother me, is the punchline. It's me, no? 
Okay, uh, I'm sorry I arrived a little bit late and the, I lost a part of the, of the seminar, but uh, I have seen that you talked about the cost of uh, the particle production. The co uh, well, I mean, yeah? the cost just means yes. how uh, much? Probably you are referring to the energetic cost of the, the particle production. Well, I was, I was intending to refer to both number of inertial particles okay. and the okay. energy that they but carry. But we have the emergence of particles uh, in the space-time. No? And then uh, I would like uh, to know a little bit about uh, the entropic cost, which is the entropic cost of this process. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's... Right, so I, I mean, my analysis is entirely about what is going on here at uh, future null infinity in terms of particles and energy. I mean, particularly what's going on near what would in the black hole case correspond to the evaporation event. I don't know how, I mean, there are a lot of discussions of entropy. You can talk about entanglement entropies and so on, but they're always infinite in quantum field theory, but they can be regularized and renormalized. I don't think I have, this work certainly has nothing new to say about that, and nor do I have anything particularly relevant or, you know, to comment, to answer your question or to respond to your question. I, I have a small question related to John's question, which is the following. If I understand correctly, in order to um, make it comp in order um, the idea that remnants in black holes could have could um, could deliver back all information according to this work, would suggest that the mass of this remnant would be of the same order of the energy radiated in Hawking energy? No, I mean, so if you had a very long-lived remnant, then it could be emitting very low frequency particles. And, and so this, then you could get around any, oh, I mean, I that see. would be an analog of letting the mirror. I see, I uh, understand now. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's, it's a, there is a question of how plausible do you think it is that you could have a Planck-sized object that yeah. sits around for longer th than the evaporation time of the black hole, way longer than the evaporation time of yeah. the black hole, and is emitting things of wavelength, you know, probably much bigger than today's Hubble radius to, you know, be right. able to manage the energy or something. Dimensional but, analysis. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, it's certainly possible in principle. To I see. Dimensional analysis would suggest that this would evaporate in Planck time. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? No? So I would like to thank you very much for this very, very nice. This is for the camera, <laughs> and this is, it's on. Okay. <laughs> so it's live right now. I'm just going to get a little more water. Thank you very much. Eu só preciso ver ah, o que está ali. Aqui? Não, o adaptador eu tenho. O que você precisa? É, porque eu ligaria aqui, mas. Não? Mas ele vai, né? Fechou? Não. 